Our guest today is the Chief Executive Officer of 1871. 1871 is where digital startups get their start. He has been described as, and I quote, something of a godfather of Chicago's tech scene, unquote, and, quote, the public face of Chicago's tech community, unquote. Our guest today earned his undergraduate and law degree from Northwestern University, and he is so smart that he brought his wife, Judy, with him today. Let's give her a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Howard Tallman. Howard? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 1871. There's a substantial number of lawyers in the, uh, in the audience, so if you'll just take a quick second and read for, hold on, let me turn my device on, uh, read this to uh, everybody at your table, it would be really helpful because here's the fact, there's been a frightening, frightening uh, number of things out there that we know nothing about, and we're going to talk about a lot of those today. If you didn't see this in the New Yorker this week, very, very significant. It says this poor guy was looking for a kidney, but he couldn't code. So that's where we're at. But the good news is there's an app for just about everything today. Uh, this is a uh, phone app that counts the calories on your desserts. So those of you who haven't had the cannoli yet, check it out. This uh, increases and shrinks your belt if you've had a really aggressive meal. Uh, this will take care of that for you and uh, ease the rest of your day. Now, I'm, I'm heartbroken that Professor Green isn't here today, but I want to share a secret with all of you. No one in the history of man has ever won an argument with Professor Green. So we've built a special app, and what this does is it creates a fake Wikipedia page that supports your side of the argument. So now don't tell him, but the next time he's giving you a lecture, which is, I think, Paul's perfect Paul. Uh, it's just a handy thing to do. Anyway, all right, so a little bit about 1871 before we get rolling. The city, the state, uh, basically 1871 on fire, and there's sort of a half a pun intended because that's where the name came from if you don't know. Uh, 1871 was named really not for the Chicago fire, but for the renaissance and the rebirth of everything in the city that followed that. And we think technology today is creating that kind of an opportunity for for us as well. So um, we're doing pretty well. Uh, Cranes just said that we were number two or three uh, in terms of job creation and growth. More amazingly, just uh, last week, number two in the nation in new job growth. And this is really, really significant. Uh, and in part, it's particularly significant because if you look around the country, there are people who are struggling with similar things and not doing remotely as well. Um, new York, announced an amazing media campaign. They spent $28 million in order to create 76 jobs. So not a whole lot of uh, much of anything. We like to think we're a little more efficient than that. So we've got about $5 million thanks to the state, and we've deployed that to create more than 2,400 jobs in the merchandise mark. Uh, and that's about 30 times the New York results, but we've actually got a building to show for it. So, and that building, by the way, the Merchandise Mart, also exploding. When 1871 started about three years ago, there might have been 100,000 square feet, Myron will check me if I'm wrong, that we would have called tech space and maybe a few hundred employees. Today, more than a million square feet in the Mart used by technology businesses, more than 11,000 jobs in one central core, really the heart of Startup City, and we expect that to grow. The good news is the Mart has three and a half million square feet, so we've got some room to go. Uh, anyway, why is job creation so, so important? Well, startups are really the only thing that's driving the recovery. New businesses have those spurts of growth and create additional jobs. Small businesses are doing okay, but new businesses are what really is driving everything. In the country, startups are declining. It has a lot to do with a lot of different considerations, but last year was the first year for sort of a really sad result, and that was that 
for the first time last year, more businesses closed in the United States than were started. And so in Chicago, we're fixing that. And we're basically focused on a really simple proposition, which is we take ideas, it's a startup factory, and we turn those into invoices. And that's, that's our job, that's our goal, and it's a pretty easy uh, and exciting metric. So who are these people? Um, basically, they're sadly deluded people. If they knew how hard any of this would be, they would never get started, but that's the good news. Uh, and in this world, there's, a, there's an interesting thing. Not knowing what you can't do turns out to be a very, very powerful advantage. And so if somebody says, well, that's not within the rules or that's not the way we've always done this, today you have a chance to reinvent the rules and to basically change it. And entrepreneurs are curious. They look at what we've seen all, all day long, all life long, but they have a skewed perspective. They have a different way of looking at this. And what's really interesting is you can be an entrepreneur at just about any age. It's not defined by age or, or by youth. In fact, within 1871, the largest single cohort of our member companies are run by people with more than 14 years of experience. So they're not kids. They're career changers. They're serial entrepreneurs. They're people who want to do different and more interesting things, and there are people with domain expertise who lack technology, and we do a huge amount of matchmaking. So age doesn't matter, and in fact, this is one of my favorite entrepreneurs, and I love her pearls as well. So she went into a bank in New York not so long ago, and she said, I'm about to take a cruise. I'd like to borrow $10,000. And they said, you seem like a perfectly nice lady, but we don't know you from Adam, so we're not lending you any money at all. And she said, well, that's not even remotely nice of you. She said, I do have tremendous collateral. And they said, OK, now we'll reconsider. So they lent her the $10,000. She gave him the keys, and off she went. She came back after her week's cruise, gave him back the $10,000 and also $6.10 in interest, and got the keys and was about to walk out the door. And they said, you know, we checked you out with your bank in Scarsdale. They would have lent you $100,000, or pretty much whatever you needed. You've had a long relationship with them. And she said, yeah, but where could you park a car in New York for $6.10? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so entrepreneurs have sort of a different take. Sometimes it's radically different. Sometimes it's pretty much straightforward. So let me, let me talk to you about tomorrow, because that's really what we're most excited about. It's pretty easy to say where things are going. We're going to have flying cars and self-driving cars and all that stuff. It's just hard to connect a prediction to a date. So uh, that's... That's what we're involved in. Today, the one thing we know for sure is that speed is critically important. Iteration and speed, and it's something that we should teach everybody. Uh, you know, we live in this world. Uh, we have, you know, sort of this idea that you go do it first, and then you apologize. And, and part of this, by the way, is shame on us, because in this country, regulation has lagged innovation by so much that it's really restraining the changes that could make things better for all of us. So we call this the Uber law, you know, which is you know, do it first and then apologize. Uh, and then this week uh, we deal with when we talk about Airbnb, and think about this, Airbnb now responsible for more hotel nights than almost any organization, any hotel chains in the world. And so they're going to get to a point where they're too big to ignore, and then we hope that the regulation catches up with these folks. So um, it's exciting, but what's really exciting is something that I'd like you to think about. You know, we used to have laws that governed businesses, and we used to have laws that related to people, but today we have people becoming businesses. And so we're going to have to change and change very quickly in new ways in order to enable us to remain competitive with what's going on throughout the whole rest of the world. So 10 things <clears throat> quickly to talk about. Number one is time, and the idea that time is the scarcest resource and that we actually have to figure out um, the things that are important to do because we cannot do everything. So we have services like Instacart. Now this is one of these new capital light businesses, okay? They have no groceries, they have no infrastructure, they have no employees, okay? But what they give you every single day is the gift of time because these businesses are all about saving us that most precious and scarcest resource. And they're exploding in every area, <clears throat> in every service that you can imagine. We're gonna see more and more time-based businesses 
but they also continue to raise the bar. Now, this is something you probably haven't heard of directly. It's customer service in the cloud, but the most interesting thing about this is this little thing in the middle. Their response time to all complaints that they handle for all the businesses that they service, on average, three and a half minutes. Try and compete with that. Try and compete with a business that is that responsive and that quick, and those are sort of the table stakes going forward in terms of this new digital economy. Uh, Amazon is so goofy that they're shipping products to places that you're going to buy. Not that you bought, that would be too easy, but that you're going to buy. Now, how do they do that? Well, wish lists and previous orders and all kinds of other sort of metrics, but the most interesting one is called cursor hover time, okay? And that's actually digital drooling. That means you looked at something <laughs> for a really long time and you haven't bought it yet. So we're going to send you a coupon. We're going to say we can deliver it to you tomorrow. And that's why they're building a 50,000 square foot facility on Goose Island, to deliver it to you tomorrow, OK? And so other services are enabling things that not simply let you search, but actually let you purchase goods and services. And Google has just announced a delivery service for same day. And here's what's insane. That's not fast enough. So all over Europe, what's going on is a new idea, and that is that you'll order online, but you'll go get it. And why? Because maybe you don't want to spend the whole day waiting for the delivery service. Maybe you don't want the guy who's following the UPS truck to steal the package right after the UPS guy leaves the package on your doorstep, okay? So in this new world, we're going to see a lot of ideas around the fact that mom with two kids would just as soon not park and take the kids out, but she loves the idea of knocking off three or four errands while she's in the car with new drive-in facilities. You're going to see more and more sort of real estate solutions around that, all time-based. And this, I know this looks like sort of a union poster, but it actually stands for basically this new idea of instant gratification, that I want <clears throat> what I want and I want it right now, and that's the standard that just about everybody under the age of 35 is living with and expects businesses to provide and every other kind of service to provide as we move forward. All in time and all right now. All of the services will have buy buttons now. That's really essential. And we learned this from games. We learned this from the massive success of social gaming. And what games told us is that each time a consumer interacts with one of these games, they make a series of calculations, and every time it's different. And so they decide what's the game worth, what's the investment they're going to make, how much time are they going to spend on that. And that's a signal to us that there's no such thing as fixed pricing anymore, that the consumer will decide every time basically what they want, when they want it, where they want it, basically without asking on their terms, at their prices, in real time and interactively. They want these things to talk back to them. And so that's the new standard. And so we can think of a continuum where some people will pay $99 and some people wouldn't pay 99 cents. But the opportunities for business in this digital world where you can fashion your products and your offering across a huge continuum are very, very exciting. There's just not going to be one size fits all ever again. That's not going to work in education. It's not going to work in healthcare. It's not going to work in any business. Now, number three is this idea of the newest currency. The most valuable thing I can give you is my attention, but not for free. And so people have to pay today and compensate us because we're busy, but we make time for what we're interested in. And so this idea of interest is really important. And it's important to understand that we're not competing against traditional competition. We're competing against everything that takes mind share, everything that takes the customer away from a focus on what we want them interested in and focused on. And so today, it's different because in the old days, location was everything. Today, the consumer is everywhere, has all the choices in the world. So it's a different deal, and we have to make a deal. We have to figure out how to incent the consumer, how to incent the client to work with us and to pick us. And so we look at advertising today as just boring, OK? Because if you're just out there advertising with the same message and the same channels, you're not going anywhere. But even if the advertising was great, you're dealing with people who have the attention of a flea. Now, 
This is Tic Tac's newest product, okay? It wasn't enough. I mean, how big is a Tic Tac? I mean, those of us who grew up with Lifesavers, at least you got a few sucks in, right? But a Tic Tac, okay, this Tic Tac changes flavors in the midst of the Tic Tac experience, all right? Because they were afraid the kids would get bored if they just had one flavor of Tic Tac, all right? I don't know what to say, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to say in terms of businesses and services and products, are they saving me time? Are they saving me money? Are they increasing my productivity? Do they help me make better and smarter choices? Do they improve my status? And for anybody under about 35 who I'm not sure even understands what the word privacy means, they don't care anyway. And why don't they care? Because we're lazy. We prefer convenience. Speed is ridiculously important, as I said, decision making, but even safety and security. I often have people ask me about privacy and they say, I'm not sure I'm giving my medical information to those folks. Um, it's private. And yet, if you were laying in the street, you would want the paramedic to know whether you had an allergy to adrenaline or other kinds of issues. So all of these are trade-offs. All of these are transactions. And we're going to increasingly say, in each and every instance, let's make a deal, and here's the deal that I value and that I'm willing to make today. Another thing that's a little frightening is that the context in which information today is communicated is far more important than what you're saying, than the content itself. And that's because we're so busy that if we're not paying attention, it doesn't matter what you're saying. It doesn't matter how you're trying to communicate with me. And so we have this interesting new idea of smart reach, we call it. And that's an obligation that every business has in your advertising, but not really in your advertising, in your communication strategy. And it's relevant and engaging and customized and in the right time and in the right place. And the test is, what do we need and when do we need it and wherever we are and, and without asking places, products, all kinds of environments will now talk to us and share information and make us better and smarter in new ways. We'll wear these things on our wrists now, you know, these devices that used to be timepieces but now are multifunction devices that do all kinds of information and provide really significant things. We'll wear glasses that watch our eyes, and so we'll be able to direct activities now without mouses, without any kind of devices at all, simply by focusing our eye intentions on what's going on. This is a wheelchair that is driven and directed simply by the guy looking in the direction that he wants the device to go. Now, this is not Google Glass, if you remember Google Glass. We don't think of that as a wearable. We think of that as a prophylactic, because who would have children with this guy, right? <laughs> I mean, this is a little bit creepy. But, but going forward, you know, Disney is implementing these kinds of tools in very powerful ways. Your magic band at Disney will open your room and pay for your food and get you in a new line and do all kinds of things. And that's just the beginning. Goofy, actually it's not Goofy, it's a guy with a huge Goofy head, but Goofy will now know because of that band your kids' first names and the city or state you're from, okay? Now, Disney uses these kinds of tools to track us because we're all connected and we're all trackable in really interesting ways. Now, you may not think a magic band is very powerful, but for those of us of a certain age, we now leave our phones on in the movie theaters, notwithstanding what they say, and that's because of this powerful application called Run P. Now, Run P tells you a good time during the movie to go pee, all right? <laughs> and it says, well, you're just missing a mushy love scene, forget that song, you don't lose any of the plot points, very, very significant. Run in and out before you even know about it. And that's, that's all because we're connected. And we're so connected, that we're just starting to see how pervasive this is going to be. Kids today, 92% of them, between 13 and 17, are connected at least multiple times a day, okay? And that's just the beginning of what's going on. Some of them never turn the device off. Mom looks at her phone on average 150 times a day, and that's mom. So we're all engaged in this new system, and we're all creating constant flows of information that permit and enable amazing things. In the stores now, we can watch how you react to end caps, to displays. We can see how long you stand in front of certain facilities and certain things like that. And so that's just the beginning. 
of static beacons and static tracking devices, what's really exciting is moving forward, more and more we're putting these on people. So we can see if the cocktail waitress at the casino is in fact taking care of the high rollers or the penny slots. We can see if the NFL players are in position and how quickly they're reacting. And so we're going to manage information, performance and behavior in a whole series of new and very interesting ways. Um, the other thing that's happening is messaging. You know, we think of email as a business tool, but messaging is the way we're living our lives today. And it's changed the game in a lot of ways too. We don't think of it as this sort of artificial and remote thing. It's a very personal thing. It captures emotions. It's fast. It's easy. It's accessible to virtually everybody. And it's growing and exploding in really amazing ways. There are new messaging services that you know nothing about. That's not you know a surprise, but it's just amazing that a service would have hundreds of millions of people, and we still wouldn't know anything about some of these things. Uh, this is a big hit in Washington, um, and what it is is basically a chatting service, but it disappears instantly. So it's sort of Snapchat for grown-ups. But all the political leaders in Washington use it now because everyone doesn't want to have the Hillary email experience. So it's a, it's a new hit. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. It's called Wicker, and, and it's worth looking at because you can use really industrial strength security, and yet you can have very efficient and effective communications with uh, people that you care about. Um, <clears throat> the new thing with messaging is frankly, we don't want to spend a lot of time searching or looking for solutions, we want answers. And so we're seeing a whole development of agents or concierges where you'll use your phone, and a kid today who's under about 10 won't say go look it up, they'll say ask your phone because they understand that that device is now a source of knowledge, information, maybe a little wisdom, but mostly communication. These are services that perform business services, errands, messages, searches, any kind of resource you need is now available in these new tools. It's all driven by a revolution that's really critical, and that is data. It's all driven by the idea that today we know everything about you all of you individually. And what we're focused on now is not demographics, that would be too easy. What we're focused on is what are you interested in because that's what really drives behavior and performance going forward. And when we look back in not too many years, whether it's in our schools or our healthcare or anywhere we look, we're gonna be flabbergasted that we tried to do it with such primitive ways and methodologies and instruments that we knew so little when so much was available, but not accessible. And today it's accessible. Today we have the tools, we have the insights, we have the ability to change behaviors in real time using this data in an amazing number of ways. And people think of the internet as an inexpensive and a fast communication system, and it certainly was, but what it really permitted was us to measure and to hold people accountable for behaviors that before were just everybody's best guess. And so today when we talk about real estate or we talk about different industries, the standards are going to be new. And this is true of medicine and education today as well. We're going to know everything. Everyone will. That's transparency. And we're going to know how well you're doing. And if you're not doing well, we'll go somewhere else. The consumer has a wealth of choices today. <clears throat> and we can measure it. And we can see whether you're reaching me whether you're convincing me and whether I'm changing my behavior. And that didn't exist before. Before, basically, advertising was essentially something that we would throw it out there in large volumes of folks and hope that it drove some commerce. And there was this great guy, John Wanamaker, who said half his advertising was wasted. He just didn't know which half, OK? So today, we've connected that equation with commerce and we can measure all of that activity and really see what's working. And that's a huge game changer. And I'll just give you a quick example. This is Ticketmaster. Almost everybody knows Ticketmaster. But this is Ticketmaster enabled by Facebook. Now, what's the difference? Well, now I can see where my friends are going, where they're sitting. I can make my choices in a much more intelligent fashion. I don't have to tell my parents that I'm going to that concert. Uh, but the idea is, Commerce is changing and commerce is being driven in new ways 
And oh, by the way, Ticketmaster couldn't do this themselves because they don't know enough about their own customers, but Facebook does. And so it's this merger of information. It's this merger of data that's going to permit us to have newly personalized results and responses. Everything is going to be video, but it's going to be a new kind of video. It's going to be highly personalized with a tremendous amount of data behind it so that it really relates to you. It's that idea, again, of smart reach. And as a world, we're moving in an interesting way. We're moving from looking backwards in what we would call analytics to moving forward to prognosticating what's going to go on. And it couldn't be more exciting. And in honor of the Blackhawks, this is the Wayne Gretzky quote, uh, which I'm sick to death of, but I'm glad the Hawks won. Anyway, the idea is this. Target, not so long ago, had a problem with a father calling up and saying, why are you sending these maternity ads to my daughter? They said, ask your daughter. It turned out she was pregnant. Target knew that, but the dad didn't know that. Fairly frightening. This was a guy who had a run-in with his TiVo. He had watched like three Broadway shows and had thought he was gay. <laughs> so he had to quickly watch uh, maybe an army movie and a couple of football games to sort of get it back to, to even. And if you don't think that's creepy enough, the credit card guys can now tell if you're going to get an early divorce. How do they do that? OK, well, same city hotel charges, flowers sent to an address, not your home. Apparently, we buff up when we're looking around. Singles bars. OK, now, why do they do this? Well, they are perverts. I mean, there's no question. But that's not why they do it. They do it for this astonishing business reason. It turns out, right after you decide to get divorced, all those charges on your cards were incurred by your ex-spouse. So, they're getting ahead of the game. They're trying to move forward. And that's this idea that we can project into the future now using this data in really remarkable ways. Here's another big change. Nobody under 30 wants to own anything. Anything. Not a car, not a home, not, nothing. Because it's not about stuff. It's not about ownership. It's basically about experience. And so access to these things is what's really important. You know, basically, you don't have to own the cow. And that's what we're seeing more and more, more emphasis on utility rather than possession in very interesting ways. And this started, by the way, and you all know this. You just don't necessarily know that you know this. It started with music. Those of us, again, of a certain age used to remember what music sounded like. Now nobody knows, OK? It's like taking a bath with your socks on. I mean, it's that mushy. but. <laughs> But the idea was that we're more concerned with mobility and distribution and speed than with the quality of the sound. Same with images. OK, who except the photographers walks around with one of those giant phallic SLR cameras anymore? No one, because you can't send the pictures anywhere. So we're interested basically in speed and quality, so-so, OK? But those kinds of changes are, are moving forward. So people today want to use it and have it be utterly disposable. I, I like to say nobody ever washed the rent-a-car before they turned it back in. That's the world we live in today. Look at this. Look at these companies that are worth billions and billions of dollars. Uber, no cars. They don't own any cars. Facebook, no content. The Alibaba, no inventory. Uh, Airbnb, no real estate. Think of crowdfunding. Some of you know Illinois just passed a crowdfunding uh, thing to help small companies raise money from the crowd. Well, that's a bank with no money. And so when we think of Indiegogo and the crowdfunding revolution, imagine the scale of this. $1.4 billion raised for 80,000 plus projects. We've raised three or $4 million just at 1871 for our companies through these vehicles. And that's just beginning. And so where we're headed is a world where capital doesn't matter at all. And capital used to be a gatekeeper. And today, in every area, every business will be Uberized. Every business will have these new solutions that have transient and variable workforces, that have no infrastructure, that have no capital cost. And that's a game changer in amazing ways. I don't know if you saw this morning Sun-Times, if anybody reads the Sun-Times. Uh, there was an article about the IATA saying, here's how we're going to get everybody's luggage to fit on the planes. We'll make them as big as a shoebox, right? A very inventive proposal. But here's, here's the way our world works, something called duffel. What does duffel do? Well, you take some of your clothes and you send it to these guys. They put it in this very clever little package, and they ship it to where you're headed. So you don't travel with anything. You just get on the plane, 
And when you get there, it's waiting in your room for you uh, from this vast inventory. When you're done, you throw it back in the duffel, they pick it up, they dry clean it, and it's ready to roll the next time around. So that's just the beginning of the ways that we're going to see change because we're constrained by a lot of different kinds of issues today. You hear a lot about the sharing economy, and the sharing economy is OK, but that's not really the right phrase. The right description is surplus. The right description is all of us, in a variety of ways, have different resources and different assets and different things that we can share and bring to the workforce. And if we're going to recover the productivity and the growth and a lot of what's going on in this country, we're going to do it by strategies like this. So whether it's chores or logo designs or helpers to do just about anything you want, and look who these people are, OK? So these are people who are young professionals. They're stay-at-home moms. They're retirees. There are all kinds of people that basically we lost to the workforce. And now we can bring them back through these new shared systems and these new sur sort of surplus or on-demand economies. And that's important because by the end of the decade, more than 40% of the company of the country will be freelance, freelance employees, OK? Right now, we have about 54 million people who are in freelance jobs. That's expected to continue to grow. And that's a huge game changer. And that's this idea that people will be businesses. And how are we going to control that? And how are we going to regulate that? And how are we going to understand that in new ways? And so where we work is going to change. People are no longer going to be constrained by just about anything, by the idea that they are uh, you know, stuck in a single place by the idea that they uh, can only work in a certain location. And so anywhere and everywhere is really where work is going to take place. Uh, we call this wiki work. It's the idea that we commute, we waste time, we have all these different places and opportunities where we could be productive, uh, where we could be more useful. Uh, and now we can distribute those opportunities to the field, to the world, really, and recover those scraps of time. And when you aggregate those, those are major, major game changers for businesses and for everything else. So uh, this is the economy we're looking to, peer to peer, very difficult to regulate, very difficult to sort of validate in many respects. But that's clearly where we're headed. And that's going to change a lot of what goes on. Now, you know, as we look forward, I mean, we couldn't be more excited. I mean, 1871 continues to grow and to expand. When we started three years ago, basically, we had uh, a pretty modest footprint of 50,000 square feet. And uh, the Mart itself, which is a huge building, had maybe, uh, you know, a certain amount of jobs. But as we look forward, we see that the future is just unlimited. And the problem is, of course, that we can look backwards and figure a lot of stuff out. But looking forwards, it's all dependent on new data and new information. What's really great is this. I mean, basically, we can learn from the past. We can react to what's going on in the present. Uh, that's fine. But we have a chance to change and leverage the future. And that's what's really exciting. And to be surrounded by, every day, thousands of people who couldn't be more excited about change and new ideas and more energetic, um, it's, really, it's really a privilege and it's been a tremendous honor for me to be part of that. And from the city standpoint, we think that increasingly we're putting the city on the map and not simply in the country, but really worldwide. And so this morning we had representatives from a bunch of French companies in the automotive space and we have the Consul General of France here today. We have uh, relationships at 1871 now that are worldwide. So our members have reciprocity arrangements with London and Tel Aviv and Mexico City and Brazil and Colombia and Turkey. And these countries are now looking at Chicago as the place that you jump off into the US economy, the place that you start your businesses. And that couldn't be more powerful for a city that a few years ago was sort of part of the flyover world. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, get your questions to Marilyn. If you've got any questions, just send them. Come on up, Marilyn. Come on, because I want to ask the first question. So I'm up here, Howard. I got my pen, and I'm going to write this question. But why, 
how should we be asking our questions? Should I borrow my friend Mr. Berman's iPad and tweet it up, or should we be get out our iPhones and you know? I mean, there's got to be a more efficient way. We did this a hundred. I'm, I'm prepared okay, to answer, go ahead. but you have to get away from the microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> So we actually have an app for that, okay? It's called conference.io, and you should look it over because it's a mobile app, and it does a very powerful thing. It lets you put a question in and send it to the moderator, but the difference is that it shows all the questions to everybody in the room, and you get to vote the questions up or down. So the, the most important questions to the largest number of people in the room basically get promoted. And so that's how we do it. We use our phones to send information, and also it eliminates a tremendous amount of redundancy. So it works out pretty well, just because if you see the exact question you were gonna ask, which happens all the time, uh, you just vote yes and it, it pops it up. So, Marilyn? We have the only question so far <laughs> from Gina Caruso with, Ch with City of Chicago Small Business Center. Now that we're seeing innovation centers, incubators, accelerators, co-working, emerging in Chicago's neighborhoods, what strategies can be used to connect this network and shepherd businesses through their go growth cycle to the right innovation center? Okay, thank you. So we're engaged uh, in a couple of different respects with taking the resources that we have, although I have to say that critical mass is very, very significant. and so. The thought that there would be 2,000 little places spread around the, the state is challenging because you need a whole bunch of people, you need a whole bunch of ideas, and then you discover that people learn from each other. But with respect to the neighborhoods, we have unique resources and we're working to push those out through video, through the cloud, through other kinds of technologies. We're also working with the schools um, basically K through 12 to create new tools with Phyllis Lockett and other people from Leap Innovations to make sure that this digital content gets out to the kids who really need it because you've got kids who have a phone but they don't understand that somebody five years older than them actually created the apps that are on that phone and so those kinds of opportunities shouldn't be lost on everybody in the city of Chicago not simply the folks who are lucky enough to be at 1871. Round of wait, 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 there's a question. I was ready to leave. Sure. Uh, the question was basically, as we um, eliminate a lot of capital expenditure, as we eliminate a lot of businesses that are capital intense and things like that, and shrink the tax base, how are we going to continue to support uh, the pensions, all the fundamental services in the city, things like that? You know, <clears throat> it's an interesting situation, but if you look at Uber, let's just take Uber as an example, um, each Uber car eliminates seven private vehicles in terms of the functionality of Uber. Now, if you gross that up, so in New York, for example, there's 20,000 Uber drivers. If you look at the impact of that, one of the really astonishing things is that in two or three or four years, we'll be able to say that the load of cars, private cars coming into the city that require parking is a tenth of what it was going to be or what it used to be, and that's probably a five-year projection that's fairly realistic. What are we gonna do with those parking lots? We're gonna recover those, and those are prime acreage right smack in the center of the city that will build new buildings and new facilities and have new opportunities. And so technology doesn't supplant necessarily the tax base, it just repositions it and sort of permits us to reconfigure it in new ways. And so I think, I think we're gonna see a lot of these different things where jobs are going to shift, we're going to have a tremendous number of knowledge workers, you know. Uh, but, you know, not so many years ago when we did Flashpoint, we did it because there were no people focused on high-end vocational training. And that's another thing. We need to figure out 
that not everybody wants to go to a four-year college and spend a fortune and do that, but they want to join the workforce and have a, an appropriate set of skills. So retraining is significant for a lot of folks. New training is significant. And then the other thing that's happening is we're not even sure that the big gap is at that age, the college age. We think there are people from, let's say, 36 to 56, and if we don't reskill them, they're shit out of luck. I mean, they may not have a job, and we have this horrible sort of vicious cycle of, all right, they become unemployed, they get retrained, they get rehired, but all of their expertise, all of their domain experience has been lost to the companies that they left. So the companies are really going to have to engage in creations of programs that permit us to upskill our existing workforce, give them digital skills, give them new exposure to technologies. Otherwise, that's the real displaced workforce that's going to be a significant issue for the city and for really the country. So I, do, did you have a question you want to just yell it out or did you? Oh, we have we it. Do okay. Have a few more. All right, we have it. Good. And this is from Dory McWhorter, YWCA of Metropolitan Chicago. What do you feel are the barriers to inclusion of women in the tech sector? So I, I really think it's going away. I mean, we have about 30 or 33 percent women at 1871. We have a new program to, called Wisdom that will just be announcing the new cohort of uh, women that will be specifically focused in on. It turns out that some of the things were things that we wouldn't know, but Pew and some of these other huge reports have indicated women tend to ask for uh, not enough money when they're raising money for their businesses. Interesting. Uh, they certainly, you know, can spend it elsewhere, but apparently for their businesses, they, they are very reluctant. Um, so that's one thing. One thing is technology support. That's another area that we're going to address. Uh, there's another, you know, thing just about community and stuff. So I, I think, though, that it's getting better. And honestly, I also think that we're getting away from heavy-duty coding you know, which is something that existed a number of years. Uh, today, we're building on top of platforms. We're, we need elegant and clever solutions. It's not so much about, you know, being able to take the phone apart. It's being able to create new solutions. And since they're more than 50% of the population, in theory, they know a great deal about what we need in some of these new businesses. And we think we'll see more and more. We, we're pretty encouraged about that. But I, would, I will tell you again, the problem starts in about fourth grade. It's not our problem on day one. The problem is fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And this goes back before Flashpoint. We did something called Experientia, and that was about fourth, fifth, and sixth graders training them to be entrepreneurs and scientists. And we wanted to keep them on the path of technology and on the path of thinking they could be owners and operators of businesses. So uh, that's where it starts. We lose about 30% of the kids going into high school. We lose another 30% of the kids in high school. Um, those are tough, tough statistics, and we really do have to fix that. Question from Sean Fallon. How do you see the VC community keeping pace with the growth of companies needing funding locally, and how can Chicago's tech scene garner more attention from VCs on the coast? Uh, well, first of all, we don't really care about the coasts. They could fall off as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Um, second of all, we don't really care about the VCs from the coast because they're not interested in what we're doing in Chicago. What we're doing in Chicago is building B2B businesses. We have this unbelievably healthy and diverse economy. The technology cost today is remarkably different. And in fact, you know, the, uh, so in the old days, we had these bad choices. You know, technology was so expensive that we could either make something perfect or inexpensive or fast. But what's changed is that today, the cost of technology has come down so far that traditional venture capitalists don't even play in this space because companies need two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollars, not ten or twenty million dollars at the beginning. Ultimately, they may need more. But what we're seeing is more and more companies that are being funded by serial entrepreneurs, by angel investors, by early stage investors, not by the traditional billion dollar venture funds. And B, we're focused on this idea of creating businesses that can serve the industries that we have here, these massive industries. You know, as Ram is fond of saying, no single industry in Chicago is more than about 13% of the economy. If you go to the coast, you're, if, if you're not media and entertainment, 
on the West Coast, you're nothing if you're not fashion and maybe a little bit of finance on the East Coast, maybe in Boston, a little bit of healthcare. Here we have so many different industries and our job is to build a lot of businesses that will fold into these industries, that will change these industries and disrupt them for the better, and that will stay here and raise value and keep jobs here. And so that's all part of the, the idea. So I don't think we're, I think we're pretty much over thinking that we're sort of an also ran or a second class citizen in terms of job creation. We know we're number two in the country, but in terms of all of these kinds of opportunities. The, the other part of this is that we say to people, if you're making these bad choices, it's shame on you. It's not the technology, it's not the cost, it's that you didn't work hard enough or long enough and really focus in on what the important opportunities are. Because they're out there, we now have the resources, we're not constrained by capital, we have more and more talent. Uh, you know, the University of Illinois generates and graduates each year more engineers and computer scientists than the top five programs elsewhere in the United States combined. Now, the job is to keep them here, so we're building a huge moat around the University of Illinois just to keep them here. <laughs> it may work, it may not work, we don't know for sure, but the idea is there are so many more opportunities with thousands of jobs just in the Mart, having tens of thousands of jobs in the Mart over the next couple of years, that will present some opportunities that didn't exist when they decided that they had to go west or they had to go east. So. We're pretty excited about that, and, and we don't think that capital is going to be a constraint anymore. Okay, we have two more questions. From the founder of the Conscious Business Network, Therese Raleigh, how can we take the 1871 model and create centers for companies and startups not centered in technology, though yeah. may use technology? So I'm, I'm not sure there are any businesses left that aren't centered in technology. I mean. They don't have to be technology businesses, but there are no businesses that aren't using technology. But having said that, we, just within 1871, for example, we have the Bunker. The Bunker is our initiative to support veteran-owned and operated businesses. We have about 25 businesses. They use technology in varying degrees, but some of them are just veteran-owned businesses that need the other resources that we have as well. So I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a situation where you should say, what is the objective if the objective is to support these businesses and to have them create jobs and grow into sustainable businesses, then those centers can exist anywhere and they're really not dependent on the technology. They will eventually use the technology, but that's really something that's sort of outside of our purview. Within 1871, we also have about nine incubators and those are focused on specific disciplines, so real estate and food and financial technology and education. These are areas that maybe two and a half years ago when 1871 started, we would have turned our nose up at them and said, well, you know, what does the real estate industry have to do with technology? Well, today, it's hard to name a business or an industry that isn't being changed by technology. So that's the scale of the opportunities that we have going forward. Finally, City Club's very own Tweed Thornton is asking for suggestions on how to get involved in Tech Week. <clears throat> so I think uh, Tech Week starts today, if I'm not mistaken, and it runs all week. It's really exciting. There are hundreds of activities, many of them, in fact, uh, virtually all of them centered at the Mart. So uh, what I would say is go online, and it's just Tech Week 2015. You can see the schedule. Um, you know, we have a great panel on Friday. Uh, that I'll be moderating with uh, some of the leaders in the city uh, in terms of technology businesses. So that's exciting. Uh, and I think that the easiest way to get involved with TechWeek is just check it out on the web. And uh, you can show up, and there's a very substantial schedule of activities all week. Okay?